I am joined by singer-songwriter Joshua Hislip. What's up, man? How's life? It's crazy, but it's moving along. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you holding up during these crazy quarantine times? Uh, we're hanging in there. We have a, a six-week-old now, so it's, it adds to the craziness for sure, but we're doing okay. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Of course, of course. So I do want to let you know my birthday is in a few days. Uh, this is for you and for anyone watching this, but I really would like a uh, birthday card. You know, one of those ones with the audio chip in it with you singing happy birthday. I feel like <laughs> that's my number one ideal gift. The number two is like a pony. So that just shows you how much I want it. Wow. Well, if I had any, any hookups, I would, I would make that happen. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. And also, I don't have any hookups, but if I did, I would. Hey, you never know. Hey, th these are weird times. Maybe you'll be like looking outside. You'll, you'll immediately see someone. They'll, they'll be the hookup. You just never know. Sure. That's right. And my, my like number three ideal gift would be like a couple autographs, but I figure when things die down a little bit, or if you ever come through St. Louis, you'll hook me up with some free tickets. It'll make that happen. I can make that happen. Yes, let's go. Well, I did see on your Instagram account, you did a little studio instrument tour. Was that in your house? Yeah, that's in my, uh, we live in a 120 year old, uh, what used to be a, a stable. It's like kind of a barn. And um, in the 60s, I think they built a little mini garage on the side. And so that's now my music room. Ooh. And uh, yeah, I hang out in there. It's, it's like the, at the highest part, I think the ceiling is like maybe five and a half feet. And then it slopes down to about maybe four feet at the, at the lowest part. So that's where I spend most of my days in a weird little garage with no windows and a bunch of instruments. <laughs> you know what though? You could totally make that your man cave, man. Yeah, it's it's pretty set up. I've got all my instruments and a bunch of stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else in the house. I was about to say, I don't know if you know this, but uh, but just looking behind you in that uh, in that live stream video, you have a lot of instruments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do, and I actually have less than I used to because um, I had to kind of downsize. I used to. So the room I'm sitting in right or next to you right here. This is now my son's room, um, and I used to have like a, a full keyboard set up with like an old Wurlitzer 200A that was fantastic and a bunch of things, but then I had to kind of fit into a garage, so I had to move some stuff around, but yeah, I still have, I think I have like one electric and like six acoustics, and then some other weird little things like a harmonium that I, I showed in the video, and yeah, yeah man, it's, I collect instruments, they're pretty fun. You know what? Hey, if you ever want to downsize a little bit more. So recently I started playing the uh, acoustic guitar and I do have to tell you, I am absolutely horrific. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I'm slowly getting better, but uh, I'm not really in love with this acoustic guitar. So if there's like a banjo or something that you don't want, I say we just do like an even trade. Oh, yeah. If you're down, I'm down for it. Once again, we'll, it is see. we'll see. Next time I'm in St. Louis, we'll see if we can set something up. Oh, you were in St. Louis before? I think I have been, yeah, um, but years ago. I did a long, a big, big tour through the States, probably like five years ago now. Gotcha. Um, it was about a month-long tour. I was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a crazy experience. And it's hard to remember all the places I've been. There, I, I, I remember being at a show in Europe once, um, and I went up on stage, and it was somewhere in Germany, and I went up and I was like, thank you so much for having me this is my very first time in and i said the name of the city and then someone in the crowd was like no it's not <laughs> oh, like, Lord. oh man <laughs> but they all blur together man when you're like flying and on that trip the the european trip i had 17 flights in 30 days it's yeah. really hard to know where you are man you know what it's completely understandable and if i were a musician which i'm clearly not i feel like i would do that pretty much at every single place i go to i'd make that mistake every time yeah, it's like that thing where you have the name of the city on the back of the guitar, and you're like, good night, and you like look at it, and then you say, Cleveland, and you just know that you've got it. <laughs> also, I'd say, because sometimes when you're watching like live concerts, the, uh, ahead of the person who's performing, ahead of the performer, they usually have that little thing that reminds you of the lyrics and stuff in case you forget your lyrics. They should just have it on there. They should, like, in small little letters, like, you're in Boise, Idaho. You know, like, you yeah. just have that. I mean, two things. First, I've never had the lyric help out thing. That would be amazing because it's it is actually really hard to remember all the lyrics to all your songs. Um, and then they never have. Uh, very rarely they have like a clock, so you know how much time you have. So it's like you're like when the when the uh, people singing are always like the musicians are like, uh, how much time do we have left? It always kind of seems hokey, but it's like really we have no idea how much time we have. Like it'd be great to just have like a clock. Lyrics, city, weather, It'd be great, you know? <laughs> you know what? You and I should go on Shark Tank with that idea. It'd be a cost-effective way. 
I'm pretty sure we'd end up with maybe like a, a Damon John or maybe a, one of the other people on there. I mean, dude, we could sell the crap or QVC. We could sell yeah. the crap out of that. You know what? You do it, and I'll just take 10%, and we'll call it even. I say we negotiate down to 5%. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll talk about it later. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, willing, I'm open to it. All right. Sounds good. Well, now let's talk about your music. I read on your Spotify little bio for your fourth length album, Ash and Stone. And I'm just going to, this is your quote on previous records. I spent a lot of time writing from a place of empathy for other people's issues. Instead, Ash and Stone was naturally my story. I really, really love that. I feel like music for me as a spectator is kind of therapy. So and it's definitely therapeutic in so many different ways. I'm really happy that you were able to, to kind of uniquely be yourself it must have felt so great to be able to get some of those emotions out there. Yeah, it's it's scarier for sure because it's you can hide behind other people's stories if you're just you know telling and you can do that in an empathic way, but you're still not really risking uh, that level of vulnerability when you're just saying like this is what somebody I know has gone through. Um, but yeah, when you when you turn the camera lens on yourself and it starts being like, hey man, I suffer or you know not suffer, I struggle with. Um, depression sometimes or I struggle with lots of different things so you, you start genuinely sharing your heart and uh, I found um, I'm way more excited when these songs are coming out um, but I'm also way more anxious and way more scared uh, to share them because it's it really does feel like if you share a part of your heart with the world and the world is like nah, no no thanks <laughs> it's like well that sucks you know yeah. But it, it's been it's been a process of um, I think for me of maturing, but also the fact that I'm married to a therapist um, that helps. You know, it's like okay, you, it is important to kind of do the work yourself and not just like hide behind other people's stuff. And and maybe it's okay to be a little bit more candid, even though yeah. that's scary. Yeah, one hundred percent. You know, it, it, it's funny that you mentioned that because my mom and my dad are both therapists. Uh, I just graduated with uh, undergrad with my BSW, so I'm going to be a therapist. My twin sister is going to be a therapist. Like, a oh my family, goodness, little family business. But uh, I, I have suffered with depression for a while, and, and, and although I'm not a songwriter or singer, something I do is write a lot of poetry, which, which for me, and I don't share it with the world, so I don't have to worry about that. But, yeah. but for me, I, I found that to be so therapeutic, uh, and, and you know, I, I think it's, I, I think it's so. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to think of the word. I, I think it's, it's very, very strong of you, uh, you know, to be able to share that with the world. I think people will certainly appreciate that. I hope so, man. Yeah, it's, um, I, I do something similar. I, uh, not necessarily poetry, but I write um, a journal. I used to journal every day. Um, and I've kind of, with life things lately, with a kid and everything, I haven't done it in a little bit. But um, I try to stay in the practice of reading all the time and, and writing uh, just kind of like daily thoughts and stuff. Um, and I find that to be pretty therapeutic. But then, yeah, it's, uh, I can't remember, there's, there's a quote about vulnerability being strength, but how it's often like we treat it as such a weakness. Like it's, you're showing yourself and that for some reason that's like, oh, you're emotional, therefore you're weak. Yeah. As if like, everyone's got them, man. Everyone, we all feel things. And if you, you might be able to mask it with, you know, just shoving it down or maybe, you know, alcohol or whatever it is, you can hide, hide behind those things. But they're there and uh i don't know i think they need to come out yeah it's one of those common stereotypes that uh that has been there for so long and so us future uh, social workers uh it's really going to be our job to, to to kind of change that mindset and luckily i think during this time especially people really are being open with mental health i, I think it's a stigma that's certainly fading it has a lot mm -hmm. of work to go but it's good that for example even something as small as you telling me about this in interviews me telling you about some interviews that that shows that you know it, it shows that it's okay to, to speak yeah. about how you're feeling you know yeah yeah and i i, I do think i've even noticed in the short amount of time that i've been in the in the music industry the questions have changed like it's not just like uh, what's your inspiration and then like you know you're kind of expected to give like a, a good little quippy line but there's if you actually if i actually went into like I, I wrestled with depression they'd be like but you're doing great now like they would try and steer it to always a positive place but it's like just because you're acknowledging that you don't always feel positive doesn't mean that you're constantly negative. It just means you're being real. Like it, the fact is life is hard and it can be really sad. And that's something I think a lot of people deal with. And there's never mind the reasonings behind that. There's just so much confusion that goes into just everyday life. Like, I don't know how anything ever gets done and I'm easily overwhelmed. And it's like, I don't think, I think in the past, 
one of the things that contributes to that depression is that people feel like that's just what they feel and no one else feels that way because no one else is talking about it. So we all just kind of bury it on top of it. And you're just like, oh, it's kind of the same thing actually is um, after we had our, our child, after like, you know, the first week we were getting messages from people being like, this must be the happiest you've ever been. And it's like, no, like, <laughs> this is the hardest thing I've ever done. I haven't slept in a week. What are you talking about? Like, no, but you're expected to say it's the best. It's like, yeah. it's not. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh my God. I feel like um, people are going to be more real. And, and that's certainly my hope uh, in the very near future that people are able to just answer honestly, rather than those automatic, like you said, those automatic reactions. Like, how are you today? Doing great. Like I, I do that all the time. People always ask, how are you today? I'm like doing well, doing well, but I don't think I, I it's like, I've like trained my brain to just automatically say, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm never real. And it, it, mm -hmm. that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. It's, and like, it's that the, we all do it, right? You see each, someone at the, you meet somebody up for a drink or something. You say, how's it going? Good, man. How are you doing? Good. It's like, that's it. Really? You're yeah. both just doing good. Okay. Yeah. And then the conversation goes on and then it's like pretty quickly comes out that you're both not doing well. Like, I'm frustrated with work or I'm frustrated with whatever. It's like, well, then when I just said, how are you doing? And you said, good. Why do we do that? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It is no. certainly, uh, it is certainly an anomaly. It's, it's, it's a weird thing. So I'm curious about your songwriting. Now that you're not writing about other people's stories, you're writing about your own. How has your songwriting kind of changed? Does it take longer for you? Have you found just by observing longer for you to write songs when you're writing about yourself than writing about somebody else? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm really careful when I'm writing for somebody else to not put my story on theirs. Um, for example, my song Long Way Down, uh, which was on my last record, that's a song about a friend of mine who, who went through a divorce. So I didn't want to like guess at how he was feeling. I wanted to make sure that whatever I was saying was like directly from him or his experience. Um, so the hardest part there is just making sure you remove yourself from the equation. Um, and then writing about yourself is I have found infinitely harder because it's like now I'm not, it's not like, well, if I got, if I get this wrong, I'm, I'm lying. Like it's, it's, you know, it's, it, if, if it's my story, I have to tell the truth. If I'm telling someone else's story, yeah, if I don't get it completely right, I did my best, you know, but if it's your own thing, it, it's lyrics take me the longest anyways. Like I, I spend, a very, very long time, most of the time on lyrics um, to try and make sure that it is genuine and it is, but it's also not just like overwhelmingly, you don't want to press play and just like have people so bummed out. And so like, they never want to listen to your music again. So yeah, it does take me a lot longer to do songs about myself. I've found in the short amount of time that I've been doing it, but I feel like it's it and not to say that I didn't love it the the other way writing for other people but I do feel the experience writing about myself has been much more rewarding personally yeah. maybe selfishly I don't know but. <laughs> I, I I think it's obviously clearly more uniquely you and it must feel so much better when you're able to get all your feelings and thoughts on paper you're able to release that song by the time that song comes out it must just feel so freaking great yeah like the song uh there's a song that came out recently called something more which is one of mine um, and that was the first time I've ever put out a song where, no, maybe that's not quite true. I was going to say something. It's maybe the second time I've ever put out a song where like I had tears in my eyes every time I would try to play it for somebody, like singing it for somebody before I recorded it or whatever. Um, yeah, that was, that was the kind of the first, and so like when that's finally shared with, with people and when the response is largely positive that's that's the best feeling in the world that's <laughs> so good I, I could totally understand talk about your your recently released song such bitter ends if you go on my spotify right now you'll see it's been played about like a trillion and a quarter times so i like, like what would you see all those like monthly listeners i'm it's at you. least like well over half of them <laughs> yes <laughs> uh yeah man that's that's uh that's very much taken from my my personal life that's that's kind of um a continuation of something more um, in that something more is kind of the rejection uh, of the search that I've been on for a really long time, or at least it's like saying, look, this is what I've been, this is how I've been searching. And it doesn't seem, to, I've been asking these questions for a really long time and it doesn't seem to be working. It's not, I'm not getting answers and I'm just being told to kind of shut up and, you know, toe the line. Um, 
And then such bitter ends is kind of more like, this is what I've been finding as I've searched more and more. And it's just the answers that you're giving me are not answers. There's just, it's just not quite good enough. The line, um, in the shadow of your wings, I found truth, but truth was suffering to me is like, yeah, I've, I, it's not like I'm not looking. I'm just being honest. What I'm finding is not, it doesn't, uh, quench my thirst at least yeah yeah yeah. i absolutely love your music man i really do i i feel like obviously i feel like there's so many similarities between songwriting and poetry i feel like you'd be such a great poet <laughs> thank you have you I've ever never, considered it no i've never tried i uh i mean i did it in like high school when you had to do it right but i've never as a as an adult i've never tried to uh to do it i don't understand like for me the most like nail on a chalkboard thing is when someone reads my lyrics out loud so then I'm like, oh man, isn't that just what, like, if you did poetry, aren't you just reading that out loud? I, I, oof, that to me takes guts I do not have. <laughs> oh, I bet you do. I bet you do. Talk about your beginnings in music. How did this all kind of initially start for you? When, when did you find that you were very interested in pursuing music? It's, it's crazy, man. It's such a, a happenstance, like a series of just like very fortunate events where I was, well, it started when my family and I moved to Scotland when I was 15 and there had been no musical anything. Like my parents had, had put me in um, piano lessons for a year and I hated it when I was like eight. And so like I never did it and I didn't learn anything. I still don't read music. So then um, when I was 15, we lived in Scotland and uh, I was getting in a lot of fights at school and I really just was having a bad time. And somebody gave my parents a bass guitar and I like picked that up for maybe two or three days. And I was like, this isn't for me, but I really like the frets and everything. And so I started playing, my dad had a guitar and I started playing his guitar. He showed me G, C and D and that was it. And then I started just kind of figuring it out from there. And it happened at the same time back in Canada, a friend of mine was also starting to learn G, C, D and whatever. We came, I came back to, to Canada the next year. And uh, he and I were, were hanging out. We were really into like this, the hippie crowd, the like the, you know, the sixties and seventies, even though we were like 16 years old. Um, so we would go down to the train tracks and we would, you know, puff the magic dragon, if you will. And we would, <laughs> and we would just teach each other guitar. Like we, neither one of us knew what we were doing, but we were just having a good time. We wanted to be like Simon and Garfunkel. And so we were no idea what was going to happen. But then um, somebody, a local guy offered to record us in his, in his basement for $10 an hour. And we did a whole record um, of 13 original songs in, in 13 hours. We sold that out of the trunk of my car. We sold over a thousand copies. And then we got approached, I went, like somebody uh, who had a friend who worked at the university, who knew a producer, like this weird, all these weird connections. They hooked us up with a meeting at Universal um yeah when we were we were only 18 19 at that point Damn. and um yeah and i said I, like so the guy that the other guy that was with me in this he ended up going to morocco on a just a trip he went by himself and he was like i don't want to do this i'm i'm going on to morocco so i had this meeting at universal and i passed on it because it was i didn't think it was a really good deal and uh they told me at that point they're like by the time you're 24 the music industry will have no use for you so they were basically like, if you don't sign now, man, like you only got a couple of years left. And I was like, I don't know what we we're talking about then. So I passed and then ended up, you know, living in and out of cars. And I lived in a hotel with like 25 other people and I had a weird, really weird run of, of unfortunate events. But then uh, I was going to do this last like goodbye show. I was going to quit music. And um, the guy who I had been, I met a guy in the hotel who, who, worked at a, at a recording studio in Abbotsford where I was growing up. And he was like, Hey man, I'll record you. I'll record a six song EP of yours for free. If, um, and if you get signed, you have to pay me back. And if you don't get signed, then don't worry about it. And I was like, sure, man. So we did that. And then um, he at this goodbye show had invited the CEO of a record label called network uh, to come down and check me out. And the CEO actually did come down. I didn't know any of this was going on. So I just played the show as like my last show. I had fun. I was like, I'm not anxious. Normally I'm super anxious before shows. And this was just like, hey, I don't care. See you later. And then this guy came up to me after and I was like wrapping cables and he like came up to me afterwards and he's like introducing himself. And I'm just super like, cool, man. Yeah, whatever. You can talk to Tyler or whatever. I'm, I'm going to be doing this for a while. <laughs> that was on a Friday night. 
And then on Monday morning, I was in Network's office and they had offered me a record deal. Dude. And it was a four album deal. And I just, this album that's coming out now is my fourth full length record. So it's all very weird how it all fell, fell into my place, into in place, I guess. Everything happens for a reason. I am a firm believer in, in fate and destiny. Do you, ever, um, do you ever kind of think back to that time when you were about to retire and wonder where you'd be now if that meeting had never occurred? Like, like what do you think you'd be doing? Well, I, the only thing I hated, I really hated school. But the only thing I liked in school was English uh, and creative writing. Um, so I feel like probably I would have pursued teaching creative writing or something. Um, but I had nothing like now that when it started working, when music started happening, it was it was sim simultaneously really exciting, but also really scary because the longer you do this thing, you know, now I'm, I'm 32 years old and it's like, well, at this point, if I stopped doing music, I'd have to go all the way back to school and try and start from some from there and figure out what I'm going to do. Um, I've invested 10 years into this now. So the, each year that goes by, you're like, should I be doing this? Or should I like also have a side gig where I, you know, whatever. But I've been fully committed to it for so long that it is like, I can't imagine doing anything else. I also don't think I have any other skills. Like I don't, I can't do anything. I, I don't, I don't have any, I can't, I'm not handy with my hands. I don't know car stuff. I don't know. I'm a bad gardener. <laughs> like, I can just kind of play guitar. That's really all I got. Oh, man. Well, you know what? I, I definitely think uh, you found your calling uh, as a musician. I am kind of curious. So your, your brief time in Scotland, do you believe... I'm, I'm trying to give a question for this because I, I think that there's something interesting here. So when you lived in Scotland, did any part of that shape your musicality? Did, did your time out there, did it influence any of your music now? I mean, I don't know. There, I, I've been told that some, some of my songs have kind of a Celtic vibe. Yeah. Um, I like Celtic music. But uh, I don't know if it was if it's like the fact that I kind of started out there. I wouldn't be surprised if that has something to do with it. I went there, like I, I lived there for that one year, but I've been, I went back because my parents, so we lived there for together, together for a year. I came back and then a couple years later, my parents moved back to Scotland for three years. So I went and visited them. So I've been to Scotland for like good chunks of time, probably six times. Um, so there's probably something to it where, you know, like you are, you, you soak up a little bit of wherever you are as a, as an artist, you're a little bit of a sponge. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's something in there, but cool. it was never intentional. It's just, it comes out the way it comes out. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I wanted to talk about some of your highlights because you have been at this for quite a while. You have reached some great stages. Talk about some of your most memorable moments. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch, man. There's some, some like just personally for me, I got to do a tour with Ron Sexsmith, who's an amazing uh, Canadian singer songwriter who's been doing this a lot longer than I have. He is like the pinnacle for me of Canadian singer songwriters. So it was pretty cool to, to get to be on a tour with him. I did five shows with him and he was a, him, him and his team were just amazing. Really, really sweet. Um, I've, I did a tour in the, in Europe with the paper kites. And uh, they would bring me up on stage and we would sing uh, I'm on Fire by Bruce, String Bruce Springsteen each night, which was really cool. Um, I got to play a show on a rooftop bar in Hawaii with Mick Fleetwood. Oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah, he played drums and I played guitar and we had a cello player that neither one of us had ever played with before. And we played my songs for about two hours at his request. Um, it goes on and on, man. I've had, I have had a, a, a long uh, run of like, I've been very fortunate time and time again to uh, have bumped into some of the kindest people in the world and get to do this. So I, I, could, I could say the highlights for another hour, probably. There's, there's a lot of really amazing moments for me. Yeah. And it must be exciting to know that the best is still yet to come. Uh, talking about inspirations, I don't know if this guy is an inspiration for you. But there's a singer named Joshua Raiden. I don't know if you've ever heard of Joshua Raiden. But how often are you two compared? Because you guys have a very similar sound. All the time. And actually, my friend uh, Danny, uh, Danny Schwartz, Danny Black is his artist name. Um, he's probably the best guitarist that I've ever seen in my life. He plays for Josh uh, Raiden now. He does the, either the backing acoustic stuff or sometimes the, the lap uh, steel stuff. Um, but yeah, there's a, so we're always kind of aware, or at least I'm kind of aware of what he's doing. Um, 
Joshua Raiden and I, from the very beginning, I, for me at least, I've been compared to him, uh, which I've, I've no problem with. I also got a lot of comparisons to Iron and Wine, John Mayer, uh, even Jack Johnson. I was like, I don't, I don't hear all of these, but okay, man. So, uh, but that's the one that has stuck the most that like, still I get told, Hey, have you heard of Joshua Raiden? We're like, yes, yes, I have. I've been listening to him for a really long time. And uh, I know we do, we have some similarities, not just the name, but we definitely have some, some other similarities. But yeah, man, I'd love to do a tour with him sometime, but it might just be like for people going, it would just be like one very long show. <laughs> they wouldn't even know what's going on. They feel like it's just, they saw the same guy for three hours. I'm thinking even bigger than, than just a tour. You guys have the same first name. You guys sound similar. Both are incredible uh, songwriters. You guys should start a band. And if you start a band, I want at least 10%. That was your number before. It's my number now. We'll get it down to five. Don't worry about it. Yeah, we'll negotiate later. We'll negotiate <laughs> later. Someone on your Facebook page I was reading, uh, I don't remember who the, who the source was, but they, they were complimenting you. They said, great music, one of the warmest, soothing, and rich sounds I've heard in a very long time. Uh, I'm super curious to learn more about your musicality of discovering your sound. Uh, talk to, take me on that process of discovering your sound, because you do have a very unique voice. How did that kind of come together? Um, like my singing voice or just yeah, the yeah, musical singing voice. Yeah. Singing voice? Uh, singing voice, man, is just like, it just is what it is. I've never had any vocal uh, training, never done lessons or anything. Um, it's just when I sing from my heart, that's the way it sounds. So I've like, I remember um, the guy that I worked with originally, my first producer, his name was Tyler Johnson. Uh, we did the first EP and the first full length and, and the second full length record together. Um, he's fantastic. And he had a really good ear. Um, and so he would kind of push me to, to do like vocal warm ups and stuff. But there was never like a, oh man, don't sing so, you know, don't be, don't be so whispery or don't be so full voiced or, don't, or like sing falsetto or don't. Or like, it was just, I'd come in and be like, this is what it is. And he'd be like, all right, cool. I've, I've, I've been very fortunate in, uh, kind of stumbling around and it, it working out, but never, it's never been a conscious thing for how my voice sounds. Yeah, I, I'm just always so intrigued by, by, by how certain musicians find their voice. Like for example, uh, I'm trying to come, you know, like Josh Goblin, oh, like I, it, it's interesting to hear how people are like vibes, like sitting in the kitchen or, you know, like, like other, other, like Michael Bublé, I don't know what, it's just interesting how people like find their voice. Like for me, yeah. like, I'm not a musician, but I, I've always, like, when I was in choir, I had the hard, and I was also newer then, but I always had the hardest time finding my voice. I didn't know whether to sing low or sing high. I just, and of course, that also is attributed to not having vocal lessons, but I'm just, I've always been so interested with how, like, I didn't know if it was like you wake up in the morning one day and you just, you know, you start singing, that's how it comes out, or people <laughs> have to, like, bend their voice a little bit to make it sound the way they want it to sound. Well, I, I actually had, um, my experiences with like early when I first started singing when I was I had this um this music teacher who was an amazing guy his name was uh Bernie Smith I was in grade five he was his name was Bernie Smith he's this uh African-American uh choir teacher amazing man and he was and I think he was in his like mid-50s when he came to our school and he used to lie on his back on the ground and he'd have, have us come up and stand on his stomach and he'd so he'd, and he'd like he'd be singing and he'd just like hold a note and you'd stand on his stomach and he's like and just to show you that like how you're supposed to properly hold a note and breathe and stuff um and i remember thinking he was the coolest but i also remember like i've i've never employed any of like his breathing techniques <laughs> i've never done it but i remember that he um we were doing a christmas pageant that year and he was he told my teacher he like singled me out and was like this one's got a voice this one's got a voice and that meant everything to me at the time so then we went to uh, the, the night of the Christmas pageant and I had a solo and I was so excited and I went up to sing and I like huh, into the mic and my voice just totally cracked. <laughs> it's like, huh, and the whole crowd, like family, friends, everywhere there, they're all just laughing and laughing. And I'm looking down at my music teacher and he's just like, come on, come on. So I, I tried to power through it and it just got worse and worse for three nights. They went to do this one each night for three nights. And after the third night, I was like, I, I will never sing again. Like, this is the worst. <laughs> Fast forward till I, till I was like 14 and my sister was driving me to school and uh, a song came on the radio that I liked. And I was like sheepishly trying to sit in the backseat and sing along. And I was like, ha, 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 whatever it was. And she just like, 
turned the radio off and like looked in the mirror at me. He was like, can you not sing? You mumble. And it was just like, oh, <laughs> so, I was for sure not going to sing. And um, I honestly don't know why that turned around other than my friend and I hanging out on the train tracks. We didn't care. No one could hear us. Right. So we didn't care. We were just like, ah, we'll just do this thing. And then never stop doing that thing. That, that first is, is like remarkable in every sense of the word. Uh, now you stepping on your teacher. I was a fat kid. So if I had stepped on a teacher, he would have had some broken <laughs> ribs. That would have been a real problem. <laughs> yeah. I've been, I've been pretty small my whole life. So he, but well, I wasn't the only one to do it. He let the whole class do it. Oh, yeah. God. I don't know how that dude uh, did that. He he must have some like injuries uh, nowadays. Yeah, right. He can't <laughs> be in perfect stuff. health after that. <laughs> he can't sing at all anymore. Can't even breathe. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Yeah, I remember when I was uh, my my dad, my mom, my sister, and I were driving home uh, in the car. It was it was it was from vacation, and Celine Dion came on the radio, and you know, I was like, uh, I, I think you know where I'm going with this, but I started belting it out. I, you know, like I started belting. And I'm like. Dang, I didn't know my earpiece. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a nerd. I was making it <laughs> like an earpiece. I'm like, hey, la, 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 la. and my sister's like, you need to stop, right? <laughs> I'm pretty Please sure don't. my dad's ears started bleeding. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I was trying to gain the audacity to sing, but of course it had to be Celine Dion on the radio. It's not my fault she came on. Yeah, yeah. It's like the hardest thing to possibly try and just out of the park, just sing. And you're like, I got this, everybody. I got this. <laughs> You're welcome in advance. Because <laughs> everyone else was kind of mumbling. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be the star of the show right here. I'm going to belt some Celine Dion. And it happened to be like her highest note. <laughs> My you expect everyone to be like, like, wow. You're like, you're not meant to be a singer. I'm like, yes, I know. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, man, man, just immediately. That's the thing, though, with, like, with singing and with, and with the guitar and everything. I, like For everything else in my life, if I try something, if I like pick up something new that I've never done before and I'm not instantly good at it if i don't think that i'm good at it i'll put it down and i'll probably never do it again so i don't really know where the the discipline came to like because when you pick up a guitar or when you start singing you probably suck like it's it's very very rare that someone just starts singing and it's like oh that's really great and then same thing with picking up a guitar if you have no training and no lessons it's like man it's really hard it hurts your fingers it doesn't sound good like I don't know why me and my friend, his name was Dave. I don't know why we stuck with it, but we played every, we, like we would skip school. We did this every day for like hours and hours. My parents actually made a deal with me where they were like, um, we'll help you buy your first acoustic. Cause I was using my dad's classical. And they were like, we'll help you buy your first steel string acoustic. If you come home from school, so you, first you have to go to school. Second, when you come home from school, you have to do all your homework before you're allowed to play. And then you have to go to bed by 1030. So I was like, okay. So I'd come home, I'd do all my homework and I would start playing guitar till 1030 and I'd go to bed. I'd set an alarm for like two in the morning. I'd get up and I'd go to the basement and I would play till about like four or five, six in the morning, go back to bed, get up and go to school. I did that every night for years, Damn. just years. That's commitment right there. Yeah. See, I actually just, uh, started guitar lessons and I stopped it very quickly uh, thereafter. But, <laughs> but but I started guitar lessons. I because I have no musical experience, like besides choir. Uh, you know, I like especially with instrumentation. I have no idea. Like I didn't know how to hold the guitar. Uh, and so I yeah. started. I went to about six guitar lessons. Uh, you know, and you know, with this COVID thing, I, I stopped it. I used that as my excuse. I was going to stop anyway. But, but I was also, I'm also one of those dudes who thinks that I can learn it by myself. And so I, I watched some YouTube videos and stuff and I just got bored. Like I'm going to keep my guitar cause it makes me look like a guitar dude, but I don't know. I, I don't think I ever want to, I don't know. I don't, hey, you know what? It's, it's weird. Maybe when I'm like 26 or something, I'll like get back to it, but I don't know. There you go. It's, I mean, it is like, it's not easy. You know, it's like, no. it's the, it, it's, it's hard. It's confusing. Like, never mind. Like, you, first, you got to figure out the hand with the chords. Then you got to figure out strumming or picking. But just, like, I, I do that wrong. I, I only use three fingers when I finger pick. Huh. So if you like, if I went to lessons now, they'd be like, stop, <laughs> stop, stop. Like, you, you're playing, you're not, you don't know how to play the guitar. So it's like, whatever, really, whatever, however you make it work, that's fine. But it is like, it's a discipline. It's something that, and even now, still, I've been doing that for over 15 years. And if I don't play it every day. I know that I can feel that like yesterday I was this good. Today I'm only that good. Like it's, it might be small, but I can tell, oh, I'm a little sluggish there because I haven't been practicing. 
but I've been doing it for 15 years. Like, when do you not have to practice anymore? Yeah. We'll always have to, always have to keep practicing. It's crazy. Yeah. Sure. Actually, in middle school, I broke my pinky, and so now it does this weird-looking thing with with it. And so, I, yeah, I know it's just it's freaking weird. It still hurts. It's like six years later. But uh, but anyway, for some reason, like so, I'm I, I'm left-handed, but I had to play. I had to learn the guitar differently for some reason. I don't know why. I don't get. I don't ask questions. Well, literally and figured whatever. Uh, but anyway, learning some of the chords, I will say the chords, like memorization, was easy enough for me. Like I memorized that, but actually, like. Putting it all together, I know this takes practice, but because I had this broken pinky, I can reach certain things that other people can't. So yeah. I, I'm just like, I shouldn't be able to do this, like, but I can. You can. You can. Superpower right there, yeah. That's crazy, man. That, that's as wide as I got. I got small hands, too. Look at that. <laughs> you break your pinky, too? <laughs> no. That's as far as I can do it. <laughs> Jeez, man. It's getting there. It's getting there. Well, besides learning how to do that with your pinky, what are your other goals for the rest of 2020 moving into 2021 uh yeah i've got a bunch I, i'm i finished my my contract my uh my record contract so i'm looking to figure out my next step there if i'm going to sign on again or do maybe do something independent um hoping to sign something um so i want to finish putting out this record which i uh, it's called ash and stone and i am very much in love with it I'd, i'm very excited for people to to be able to get it um so put that out. In the meantime, I would like to be writing uh, another, probably another full length record. Um, and those are like, those two things are probably my most, like the most important things musically for me right now is to put out this record and do a good job of, of promoting it and then to write a new record that I love. Um, but that all kind of is secondary right now to figuring out how to be a dad and to be a good dad. So. I want to do those two things and they're the most important for my career. And that's what I'm looking at doing, but that has to fall in line with the other part, which is like, Hey man, I'm only, I'm only uh, just over six weeks into dadhood and it's a wild, wild ride. So yeah. Uh, yeah, keeping it probably a little bit more modest with my goals this year, but yeah. We'll, see. well I appreciate the time. I know, uh, I know you had to make some uh, time in your calendar when you have a six week old, so I appreciate it. I'm going to leave the floor to you. Anyone you'd like to thank, how can people find you on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook? Uh, thanking, first of all, everybody who has been stre uh, streaming the new music. It's doing really well, which is really exciting. Um, and everyone who has been supporting me since the beginning, that's huge. Um, honestly, it's the only way that I get to do this as a job. So that's pretty amazing. Sharing the music, uh, streaming it, watching my online shows, which I do usually every Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesdays is Instagram, Sundays is uh, Facebook, and you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Joshua Hislop, which is a strange name. It's Joshua spelled normally, and then Hislop is H-Y-S-L-O-P. But yeah, that's where you can find me. Perfect. And you know what? For one of your upcoming lives, if you need a, a horrific backup guitarist, you, you, you ring me, all right? I'll be next to my phone. <laughs> You'll be the first one that I call. Let's go.